Hey everybody, we're going to look at chapter 21 now, Continuity and Change in East Asia. Uh, much of this chapter is on China, uh, a lot of it, most of it, yeah, most of it's on China, of course Japan as well, China, Japan, some trade, uh, a little bit of, um, a little bit of commerce, but yeah, gives you an idea. Uh, okay, well, let's look at this. Continuity and change in East Asia, 1400, 1800. Again, we're looking at the same years. Uh, pretty soon we're going to be changing up the years, but at least for the moment. Looking at the same years. All right. Okay. Ming China, 1368 to 1644. Uh, if I mentioned it before, if I didn't mention it in any other videos, I do sometimes... Uh, skip things. When I originally created all these PowerPoints over 10 years ago, I made them very detailed, very in-depth when I was a new teacher. And I realized over time that there simply wasn't enough time in a class to cover everything. So over time and over the years, I've had to cut things here and there and just make decisions of what I think is more relevant or important or significant. And so if you do ever see where sometimes the um, <clears throat> PowerPoint numbers and letters don't match up, it looks like something's missing, that's because that's something I took out that I used to teach, but I've decided uh, for those reasons to remove. So don't be concerned. Uh, there's nothing missing. Uh, you're, you know, I'm, I'm relating to you and going over to the things I think are appropriate that's also something else I didn't, I haven't really uh, mentioned in any other video is uh, these lectures are designed for a classroom. Um, of course, due to COVID and whatnot, there, everything's online. And so some of these lectures are designed for an hour and a half class. Some are designed for a three hour class. Some are designed so I can do two lectures within one three hour class because I've taught, I've taught 50 minute classes, hour 20 minute classes, three hour classes even taught five-hour classes in the summer. <laughs> yeah, those are fun. Um, anyway, so that's why there are a lot of varying. That's why we have some video lectures that are an hour and ten minutes, and I have others that are almost two and a half hours. So, all right, so the examination life. Our examination of modern China begins looking at the examination life in Ming China, Ming era. Ming era. Um... um we're not going to spend a lot of time on the Ming government because most of the Ming uh, period, if you look at the dates, is actually before this class. This class is really 15, 1600s modern world history, but the Ming China was founded in 1368. So I would have actually covered that more in the previous uh, early world history class. Now, among the Chinese, education has historically probably been the most important status symbol, and it probably even is till today the most important status symbol in society. Uh, and therefore, a high education, being a teacher, or in this case, being a civil servant, a government worker, was one of the highest status you could have in society. Um, it would have been high education, high expectations, incredibly stressful, uh, and good paying um, as well. And you had to test. You had to test to do anything and everything to be part of the civil servant, to be a government, basically a government employee. And the way they did this is these civil servant exams. Uh, anyone who wanted to be have one of these positions had to take these exams, these, these incredibly complicated tests, multi-stage tests. They'd be conducted over days or weeks. They might have to go through almost like a competition. They'd have to go through a round of testing, and then those that scored the highest would go to the next level and do more testing. Incredibly competitive uh, stuff. You had to study. Typically, one of the cores of the exams was the Confucian classics, the studying of Confucius um, and the teachings and philosophy there. These teachings were often thought to, to be relevant to propping up the empire, the emperor, to being the most service to the government, which was supposed to be like service for all people to be the most benefit to the state. Uh, multiple levels from the local, regional, to the capital. Um, some people, uh, really those that were successful, would often start studying as young as three or four years old. And they would literally study into what would be high school age. And so 10, 15 years of study. Constant study, 
uh, sort of a thing where it would be like the top 1%. This was the, the pinnacle of Chinese society in this time period was to be a civil servant and serve the state. It was really quite, quite challenging, quite prestigious. Um, the only way a Chinese citizen could become an official, uh, to, to become an official, to be a government official, was to pass these round, different rounds of examinations. Um, they often would bring thousands of people to the capitals, taking the tests, and if you were successful and you were, uh, you did well, you would get a very prestigious high-level job in the government, and this was uh, what many would consider at the time probably the largest government on the globe. The Chinese uh, bureaucracy employed millions of people across the entire nation. Um, and uh, those that failed would go back to their homes in disgrace. Yeah, no pressure. Uh, oh, this is a cheat sheet here on the left. This little thing you see in the palm of the hand. That is what is uh, thought to have been an actual cheat sheet for, for the civil service exams with the Confucian classics on it. Yep. Students have always found ways to cheat. Uh, it's interesting. And this is a painting down here in the bottom corner of students taking the exams. Actually, students coming and taking the tests and the exams uh, in Chinese society. I don't know the date. I don't have a date for that painting. It's just it's something I found, I found which demonstrated the civil service exams. I think it's really pretty. It's a quite, quite beautiful. All right. Next thing we looked at, everyday life. Everyday, what was life like in Ming China in this time period? Remember, we're primarily just looking at the 15, 1600s, sort of the later Ming period. Uh, this was the most populous place on the globe as far as a united, a united government. It was the most populous. Yes, some, yes, bigger. Some of those, those Muslim empires were bigger as far as square mileage, uh, area. But as far as population density, this was the highest. Um, China is an ancient civilization. They had ancient empires uh, with authority and power predating Roman empires, ancient back as, as like the Egyptians. Um, and so large population, incredible cultural history dating back thousands of years. And of course, they were some of the most advanced manufacturers on the planet, making things far more advanced, far more complicated. They produced steel. There's evidence of steel in China. Again, this is not in my notes, but if I remember, like something like 1,500 years, a millennia and a half before they ever produced steel in Europe. Uh, probably borrowed or stole the idea from the Chinese. Uh, printing. They developed printing in Asia 500 years before it was developed in Europe. I think Korea, actually, is where printing was developed. Um, anyway, so... Their advances were incredible, really. Textiles, paper, all kinds of manufactured goods, silk. Um, Ming, you may have heard of Ming vases. They are some of the most prized vases in the world. Uh, I've heard of them going at auctions for millions and millions of dollars. Um, yeah, things like that. Porcelain, paper, textiles, silk. Writing, uh, literature, literature. Of course, printing had existed, uh, it was probably invented in Korea uh, centuries before this. So they had printing. Um, we see literature sort of transforming Chinese culture. Uh, the full-length novel was introduced to readers during the Ming period, the first full-length novels in the world. Book illustrations accompanied most literature. That in itself was an art form. People would study their whole lives and work their whole lives just to do illustrations and books. And of course... Even though there was printing and, and even a, a form of mass printing, it was still much slower, much more tedious than, say, like printing press. And um, most books, even, even after the printing press was invented, most books were still initially being created one at a time individually, especially if they had artwork. Um, uh, writing was much more interesting, too, in the fact that writing often involved common people. You might think, well, is that interesting? Actually, it would be because it involved the lives of regular people, which was just, you know, the 90% of just regular folks and involved their lives. What life was like to live as a citizen uh, on the streets and the farms of China. Um, we see other types of recreational activity, recreation, relaxation, rice, wine, tobacco plays, music, incredibly culture. Um, it, it, the, the first cultured civilization in the world. 
here's the here's the difference, which I really cover a lot in early world history. The first documented cultural civilizations in the world would have been Egyptian, but China probably predated that. The problem was China, everything in Egypt was made of stone, stone, which means it survived. It still survives today. You can still go there and see the stuff today. Um, most things that are made in China didn't last. They were made on animal products, wood products, tree, tree and products. Um, a lot of, a lot of stuff that basically simply degraded, disappeared, gone. So even though China probably had a significant advanced culture predating thousands of years before this, we don't have it. It's simply gone, disappeared to the elements. So we don't really have proof of it. Egypt, of course, we have the proof. It's, it's hard proof in stone and, and rock. Um, but it, the point of all that is the culture of China dates back thousands of years, and it was probably the, most, the very first really advanced culture on the globe, most likely. Um, East Asia was, probably. Uh, let's see what we have going on here. Uh, it was just still rice, tobacco, I talked about. Tobacco introduced from the Americas, became a Chinese favorite. It becomes really problematic in a later year. Uh, tobacco in China becomes really, uh, becomes a national crisis, actually. Tobacco and the drugs that are also imported along with the tobacco. We'll talk about it in a later chapter. Uh, agricultural improvements, we see uh, increased food, um, all kinds of nutritional value. China greatly benefited from global trade. Even though they didn't really inst instigate this trade, a lot of this trade came to them or was forced upon them by Europeans. These Europeans showed up with all kinds of crops, all kinds of things and food and crops and plants and agricultural products and manufactured products that China didn't have. They simply wasn't indigenous to East Asia. Lots of things from the Americas, lots of things from Europe even. And it actually expanded their diet. It actually made them healthier, generally, because the more broad diet you have, you get all the different vitamins and minerals. You get all the different nutritional values. So this is an interesting thing that was developed. Um, who knows exactly when this was developed? It's unclear. It probably is ancient. But they would have these rice paddy fields with fish, and mosquitoes, of course, are really, really bad. And because there was so much rice produced, mosquitoes pass disease. Mosquitoes are incredible nuisance. Um, they would fill these fields of rice paddies where they actually the rice, the, the plants sat in water, and then they would fill them with fish. The fish would eat all the mosquito eggs, larvae, basically eliminating the mosquito population before they hatched. Simultaneously, the farmers could harvest the rice. They could harvest the fish as long as they did it carefully. And so you have this symbiotic relationship. Symbiotic, is that, is that the right word? Um, of the fish and the farmers and the plants and the fish were able to survive off of the, the eggs. And it was an incredible relationship and it was very healthy. They had fish, they had rice, they got rid of a, a disease vector. It worked out quite well, actually. Um, uh, sugar cane, wheat, things like that. Now, many parts of China were actually populated by force or coercion. Um, this is not, we don't classify this as slave labor, but the majority of Chinese citizens worked on agriculture and farms, dirt poor, um, total abject poverty, uh, just surviving off of the products they produced in agriculture for the larger kingdom, the larger empire. And many times they were forced by the state to actually relocate. They would relocate entire villages and towns to regions where there wasn't a population. So they would move thousands of people, forcibly coerce them or, or relocate them by military force to other regions to basically spread out the population because China was incredibly population dense in certain areas. And so they forcibly relocated people to spread the population out because um, it was all for the good of the empire. Uh, this was really about everything in Chinese culture in this time period. It was all about the good of the state, the empire. Individual necessity was meaningless. It was ingrained into their culture, their psychology. Your individual needs of the individual really was nothing. Everyone was expected to be selfless. Everything you did wasn't for the good of you or your family. It was for the good of the entire country. And therefore, if your entire life had to be basically destroyed to make things better for the rest of the country, so be it. Interesting. Interesting stuff. Okay, we'll move on. Beautiful. I love this. This artwork is just gorgeous. 
um, really pretty. Uh, this is a romance literature from a romance novel. This image, this beautiful painting, or this this painted image in a book. Uh, beautiful illustrations. Um, this was a print that was done with wood blocks. This was part of the printing process. Wood blocks is where they would actually take blocks of wood and they would carve. They would actually, that's how this is a mass produced book. They would carve the images into the blocks. And again, I'm simplifying it. And then basically you use it like a stamp. They would basically ink the blocks. They would carve it into the blocks and then they would, they would put the, push the blocks on a piece of paper. Therefore they could sort of mass produce the images. And then they would go back afterwards after the image was on there and they would actually paint in all the important stuff. They would, they would highlight it and paint in the, the details. But the major part of the image was mass produced on a piece of paper by using a carved block. Pretty cool. Um, it's beautiful. Um, so we see this. We see images like this that were very popular for people who lived in towns and cities. Uh, the most populous cities on the globe were in China. Uh, cities and towns would be full of business people, artisans, merchants, you name it. All kinds of popular entertainment, novels, and plays. Um, very interesting. Um, this was meant to be sold as for profit. This was a business, uh, the printing of these books and the, actually the creation of the blocks. Um, writing plays, scripts, theater. It was really what we think of globally as the first uh, mass-produced uh, entertainment, popular entertainment. The first mass-produced popular entertainment on the globe uh, was probably this kind of thing. Uh, there were thousands of these books made um, with images, most more like this. Um, it's also interesting, though, some were actually sexualized as well. Um, they had what we would probably classify as pornography today. Uh, but with that being said, the majority of the images were this, more tasteful stuff, more about culture. Again, this was a romance novel. Um, but yes, they did have, uh, as every society does, a little bit of more of the more darker, seedy, a little bit of more of the taboo stuff. Uh, you know, they all did. Ming decline. Uh, Ming decline. Towards the end of the period, the, the uh, early uh, 17th century, late 16th century, um, all kinds of military conflicts. It's really interesting. You see a pattern if you really sort of connect the different chapters in world history, like looking through all world history. Most empires, whether they're a short-lived 100-year empire or a 1,000-year empire, their decline is almost always associated with military conflict. Almost always. Now, it's hard to say which came first, the chicken or the egg. Um, it, did the conflict cause the decline, or did the decline cause the conflict? It's, it's I think, you, in most situations, probably some of both, uh, either or, both. Um, but, yeah, they're almost always associated with lots of conflict, lots of warfare, and the decline of empires. It almost always goes hand in hand. In hand. So due to a lot of this warfare, a lot of this conflict with Korea and Japan, the Mongols, we see losses of revenue. Uh, we've seen this before. You know, you pay for war year after year, decade after decade. It just drains your treasury. And eventually tax revenue can't keep up with the constant warfare and the constant attacks, the loss of population. China, there's times in this period that China was known to have million-man armies. Um, imagine how much money it costs to pay for a million man army uh not just the not just the wages but the food the supplies all the support units in a typical military for every soldier you have you need one other person as a support so if there was a million men there were hundreds of thousands if not more of support units doing all the other stuff the clothing and the food and prostitutes most most pre-modern armies always had prostitutes with them uh, that followed along and were associated. Um, you name it. Uh, it's an incredible drain on the resources of a country. Uh, constant warfare. We also had the Little Ice Age. Remember that? This is the same time period when Little Ice Age hit Europe. Well, it also hit China, which means there was a drop in agriculture. It got colder, harder to produce food, harder to produce crops. We see famine, starvation, a reduced growing season. Um, no one knows sure for sure, but most historians would estimate that during the end, the last couple of decades of the Ming China, several million people died of starvation. Not warfare, they simply died of starvation. With the little ice age hitting, they simply ran out of food. 
Uh, they simply couldn't grow enough crops to, by this point in time, Ming China probably had close to the 300 million mark, something like that. Um, that's a lot of freaking food to feed 300 million people. I mean, even the United States today, what are we at, like 360? Uh, our country today is only like 360 or something around that range. So add into that there was weak emperors, the political system went into decline, the Ming Dynasty was in really bad shape. Um, food shortages, starvation, we have multiple natural disasters, droughts, floods, locusts. That picture on the bottom is locusts. Kind of like epic right out of the Bible kind of stuff. We still have those today. We still have locust plagues today. And locusts can clear an entire field, an entire region of farms, of all their food. Eat it all in a matter of days. And these locust swarms are so big that they're, they can reach populations of over a billion. Over a billion locusts in one swarm. And they could literally clear entire regions out of all their food, all their crops in a matter of days. Um, yeah, uh, we see all this kind of stuff happening. Uh, they raise taxes to deal with this. As again, you run out of money, so you start raising taxes. Of course, when you raise taxes, what happens? The people get angry. The people get upset. The people get, they, they start to rebel. They start to want to overthrow the government. They start to say, well, you know, this government's not good. We've got all these problems, all these crises, all these catastrophes, these wars, these famines. Uh, inflation rises, food shortages, people are starving. You put all that together and society simply collapses. Uh, and Ming Dynasty does just uh, collapse. Um, and we talk about what happens following the collapse of the Ming Dynasty. Now, we see after the Ming Dynasty, we see a, a pretty strong era of, of peace and prosperity. Uh, the Manchus leading us to Xing. I believe this pronounced Xing, I believe. Xing China, uh, 1800. We see some competent, long-lived rulers. Um, uh, for about 135 years after the fall of, of, Ming, of Ming China, we see uh, another empire sort of rise up. And ooh, 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 I actually skipped a page. Ooh. Uh, we actually see uh, uh, we see another empire rise up and become quite successful, and another long lived another long lived empire. What's this one about? Uh, Two hundred and fifty years, two sixty years, or something like that. All right, who are the Manchus? The Manchus came in. They were called Manchus because they came from Manchuria. Uh, China is often categorized as in three regions. You have Central China. You have northern China, Manchuria, and then you have southern China, which is, wow, I completely just blanked on that. Okay, I completely just blanked on that. Don't worry about that, sorry. Um, northern China, northeast China, which borders the Mongolian area up in up northern Asia, uh, Manchuria. They lived in close contact with the Mongols, the Koreans, the Chinese. They were farmers, hunters, gatherers, excellent horsemen, uh, horse warriors, horse soldiers. They were organized under their leader, uh, known as Nerhachi, uh, 1500s. Now, initially, which is interesting, initially they were invited in. They were actually invited in by the Ming emperor. Why? To try and keep the peace. They offered, in essence, they were brought in as select mercenaries. They were brought in as excellent soldiers and peacekeepers, and because they were horse soldiers, they could move quickly, which meant they could respond to crises, they could respond to revolts or uprisings very quickly, rapidly, with their, their basically their, their horse armies. They could quickly move across the landscape, and they could be reactionary to uh, put down uprisings and things like that. And so they were brought in as sort of this, I don't know if you want to say peacekeeping force, because, you know, did they really bring peace? They, they sort of brought peace, but it was peace through violence. Um, they came in and, and put down the uprising, which I'm sure resulted in deaths every time. And they really brought them in to try and do this. Well, here's the funny thing. The people you brought in to actually keep the peace, for they did that for some decades. But they saw an opportunity and they basically a fracturing empire and they took, took it. And they took it upon themselves to sort of take over 
when they realized there was a very weakness in the, in the empire. Um, so they come in this, they did this. Um, the Ming general was Wu Sang. I know I say some of this stuff wrong. I apologize. Don't take it personally if I don't say things, I don't pronounce things right. I do, do the best I can. Uh, Wu Sang Gui, um, to defeat these rebels, the Manchu, the Manchus helped liberate Beijing. And then after doing this, after being there for a few decades, they basically decide to take over, to, to take over the place. Um, you take the throne themselves. This is really what begins this this, this Xing China, um, which does last again two hundred and sixty plus years, which is another interesting thing, and it leads into this time of peace. This time of peace after the the, the Manchus come in and take over and institute this new empire. Uh, dynasties. I talk a lot about Chinese dynasties uh, when I talk about early China in the, the early world history class. What is a dynasty? It's hard to really define it because what we will find over thousands of years of Chinese history is at its most basic level, China doesn't change. Culturally, religiously, and the religion is basically like a like an ancestral cultural religion. It's not it's not Christianity or Hindu or Buddhism, nothing like that. Um, it's nothing like that. It's a, um, it is a, again, it, it's, it's, it's not animistic. It is a cultural religion, religious beliefs, more spiritual belief, uh, often involving ancestors and ancestor worship as part of it. But it's not a traditional world religion like we're used to in the Western world. It does not really reflect Christian, Christianity or Islam or Judaism. It doesn't really. It's different. This cultural religious belief, the culture, the, the language, the core language, even though language, there's so many different dialects, the core language, the culture, the belief, the idea of honoring the family and the state, uh, art, not much of that changed for thousands of years. So even though these different dynasties came in, these different governments come in, uh, the actual life and culture of your typical Chinese citizen did not alter much. Um, so when we call these different dynasties, the real significance is simply who, what kind, what the rulers were like, and who the rulers were like, and how they ruled. But as far as life of a citizen, it wasn't much different. Uh, it didn't really change much on a day to day, year to year century to century, empire to empire difference. The rest of the world we refer to them as empires. Generally in China, they're referred to as dynasties. Um, it's all the same area though. Don't get me wrong, the area does increase and it fluctuates back and forth, but it's generally the same core area of what we think of as central China. We see a lot of population increase under the Manchus. We see climate change. You see, prosperous. Of course, the climate change goes back to the Little Ice Age. You know, lasted a few decades. It returns. We see, of course, all the new crops coming in, all the new food coming in, as I already talked about from from global trade. Um, we see population growth, standard of living increases, and this was probably, um, especially by the middle of this dynasty, you know, eighteen hundreds. This was a very prosperous place, very prosperous, well off. Um, culturally very advanced and very successful, uh, producing global goods, global trade. The thing they didn't do, which is the one thing that got them, the thing they didn't do, which the Europeans truly mastered, was navy and global expansion. Chinese never did that. There was never this desire, really, through the entire history of, of, of China, for global expansion. There could be a lot of reasons for that. Uh, it's hard to really speculate, but it was just never something that was a, a goal or a focus. Now, maybe because they're such a huge area. I mean, China was basically the eastern half of Asia. They had such a massive area. They had so much internal natural resources every type of climate, every type of product and good and resource could probably be found within the borders of China or the general East Asian region. So they didn't have to go globally searching for all those things. Um, maybe they just weren't greedy, like the Europeans were. 
Anyway, uh, the Europeans had that one thing going for them, and because the Europeans did expand globally, they had access to so much more resources, so much more capital, money. Um, it does it does hurt China in the long run as Europe comes to dominate the globe. Uh, China really does not become a competitor in that. Um, this gives you an idea here. You have Korea, Japan, China. This gives all some different regions. Um, sort of shows the different type of economic activity. We have lots of agriculture. Uh, nomadic. Nomadic is basically the, the nomads, either horses, uh, herding animals, or people actually herding sheep or goats or other types of animals, cattle, whatnot, um, as opposed to direct farming. Hunting, fishing, agriculture, uh, fishing, gathering, agriculture. It gives you an idea of this broad uh, economic uh, production for uh, East Asia here. In 1800, we've already talked about Russia. By 1800, Russia had expanded from Europe all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Um, even though this was sparsely populated, there was very few people up there. They claimed it. They claimed it all. Um, and because Russia had been had been had mastered horse soldiers uh, long before this, uh, that allowed them to sort of dominate the Asian continent uh, all the way across. Okay, now we get to what I actually started to talk about a little bit ago. Uh, the Manchus uh, in Xing China, eighteen hundred, competent, long-lived emperors. Kang Zi worked hard at trying to unite the Manchus and the Ming loyalists. This is early on. Uh, trying to bring the people who were loyal to the Ming dynasty into the fold to sort of find this, this uh, cooperation between the old dynasty, the new dynasty. Trying to unite the two so there was less warfare, so that it would be a more peaceful transition. Um, he did an interesting thing. He tried to com he compiled um, the history the history of the Mings, to make peace between the two peoples. What he did was he did what we would call today, we would, re, we would call this in the history field, revisionist history. Basically rewriting what really happened, rewriting history. And what he did was try to rewrite history to make it seem like the Mings and the Manchus were all the same. That they were literally cut from the same cloth. They were the same people. They, uh, they just... You know, this is just the new version of them, but they're all sort of descended from the same. They're all connected. They're, uh, you know, they're all really the same. They were like us. We are like them. We are just continuing, continuing the next stage in our empire. Um, we're not, we're not conquering them. We're not conquering the empire. We're the same people. Of course, they weren't. Uh, they were not culturally, uh, ethnically, they were not the same people, but they wanted to convince the rest of China they were, so it would be an easier transition, less warfare, and of course, that they could sort of take over the general populace. It was successful. Uh, re rewriting history to make it seem like, we've always been here. We're just one of you guys. Uh, we've always been here, um, even though they had not. It's interesting. Um... 1984, anyone? For anyone who's familiar with that. Uh, all right. Yongens, I I hate that I'm probably saying these all wrong, was a second emperor and had minimal impact before um, uh, Xin Long uh, took the throne. So we have a couple of emperors here. Long lived and competent because look at it. Uh, Kang Zi ruled, or that's probably his life, actually. That was his life. Lived for, what is that, 60 years? Oh, actually, that's ruling, isn't it? That's ruling time period. So he ruled for 60 years. Yang Zin ruled for 13 years. And then Xin Long ruled for 60 years. So altogether, that's close to 135 years with three emperors. That's pretty unheard of. Anywhere in the world, having three emperors to, in a succession for 135 years, that's, that's, I don't know statistics, but that's probably got to be a better record. That's a lot. Um, uh, and they were good. They knew what they were doing. They ran a good empire. It became a successful multi-ethnic uh, empire. Uh, the last one worked at uniting Chinese and Manchus. He also tried to include all regions in this empire. Learned, he learned multiple languages. He was able to, to 
speak. By the end of his life, he's able to speak over seven languages. Very, very high IQ. Uh, lots of research has shown to be able to speak many languages, you have to have an exceptional IQ to be able to do it and to converse, uh, to understand uh, Mongolian, Manchurian, Chinese, Tibetans, others, Korean. He fostered arts within his palace, um, economic, cultural prosperity. By the end of this time period, China was wealthy, successful, exporting textiles and porcelain all across, all across the globe. Um, still primarily through European merchants, though. Again, another thing, they weren't really doing the travel and the export. They were culturally... Um, I don't know how to put it. I don't know what the right word is, but they were they were standoffish culturally. The Chinese considered their cultural superior to anyone else. Now that's not unusual. A lot of cultures, a lot of people think you know we're the best. A lot of people do that, but they did think that, and so they did not want to really go out themselves around the world because they thought they would be polluted or damaged some way culturally or spiritually. So they were okay to sell their goods when the merchants, you know, sailed up on their shore with their ships. They sold their goods to them and trade for whatever the Europeans showed up with. But they themselves didn't really want to go out and interact with the population of the world, believing it would somehow contaminate them culturally, spiritually. Um, uh, I, it, yeah, there was a very strong feeling of this. Um, and that may be one of the driving reasons why China never really explored globally, never really pushed for global exploration. Uh, there's again, there's probably a lot of reasons for that, but this may be one of them. Uh, but they were happy to sell their goods to the Europeans when they showed up with their ships, sold them all kinds of stuff. Imperial expansion. Uh, they do expand into East Asia. Again, they stick with East Asia, Mongolia, which is north, Taiwan to the southeast, Tibet to the west. Uh, they do stay just in Asia. Um, we see them, victory was assured, they had weapons, they did have some musket and cannon technology that they had actually bought and purchased from uh, Europeans. Um, and we see them for the very first time expand into some of these regions outside of East, outside of, of, of China, very proper China, into these other regions. Uh, as they moved westward, they made contact with the Russians, of course. Uh, to avoid warfare, the Russians and the Chinese made multiple treaties, multiple deals, which established trade net networks with them overland, as opposed to ships, overland trade networks, and further uh, established a peace deal between um, the early Russian government, uh, early, like predating the Romanovs. It was like uh, almost, oh, wow, like early 1600s. I don't know if I have a date on here. I do. There it is. Uh, later than I thought, actually. I thought it was early 16, late 1600s. 1689, the Russo-Chinese Treaty. This is hugely significant because this, in essence, creates a peaceful agreement between what were, were two of the most powerful empires in, in Asia, or maybe the two most powerful empires in Asia, maybe, uh, militarily. And this treaty... I don't know this treaty officially, the treaty, but this peaceful arrangement between China and Russia is never really broken. I'm not saying China and Russia don't have disagreements. I'm not saying there isn't some warfare here and there. But China and Russia never really go to war, even though they are both huge, powerful militaries, big populations, um, bordering each other, probably, I don't know, thousands of miles of border or close borders. They manage to keep the peace into the ongoing centuries. They never really go to like any type of full-blown conflict, even though lots of other countries do. Uh, this allows both of them to sort of prosper well. <coughs> they never really take territory from each other. And it could be argued, certainly, that probably by the 1800s, the two countries that controlled the most territory in all of Asia was Russia and China, certainly. Um, including all that land wealth, all those resources, all that natural resources. Um, it was interesting uh, that you had these two monster empires bordering each other, and they, they, in essence, found a way to live quasi-peacefully next to each other for centuries. That's a very unusual thing in world history, especially during this period of the 16, 17, 1800s, when there's so much expansion and conflict between global powers, and these two were global powers. 
and it, 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 it it's interesting because in later years um, they become you get to the 20th century and they're very friendly I, you can't go so far as to say they're allies but they are quite friendly in later years um, and technically yes technically in World War one and two China was an ally of Russia they were our ally too actually in both wars technically um, uh, okay let's switch gears a little bit and look at Japan Japan 1600s all right Japan the Tokugawa government uh, we have Hideyoshi Tokugawa now Hideyoshi was a peasant eventually a peasant born a peasant eventually coming to rule all of Japan now that's a success story that's something to write home to mom about right there a peasant who eventually comes to rule all of China or pardon me Japan um, uh, he united Japan north and south for the first time in hundreds of years in the 1500s um, now Tokugawa uh, rose up through the ranks I believe as a warrior um, uh, warrior warrior prowess was maybe the most respected trait in Japanese society uh, was your warrior ability like in China the highest respected trait was your intellectual capacity it was simple that was the highest level your intel int intelligence your knowledge Japan your highest uh, the highest prowess and the highest respect you got was for your martial capacity martial meaning your ability of, of war your ability to fight weapons and war and strategy and tactics still using your mind uh, although physical combat was important as well he rose the ranks through there and eventually becomes the regent which is sort of the assistant um, the sort of assistant to Hideyoshi um, and eventually actually takes over he's behind the scenes and then sort of supplants and takes over the empire takes military control this is how it works he was the regent the one behind the scenes assisting Hideyoshi um, I believe Hideyoshi dies or hands off the power to his heir, which I, I, I guess is a son. And Tokugawa decides he will be better running Japan and do a better job than the new emperor, the new ruler, and he simply takes over. Um, he was put in a position to sort of run the country for years as the regent, the one who was sort of actually running everything for the emperor. And then when the emperor hands off his power to the heir, Tokugawa just decides he's going to run the show. And he simply takes over. Um, um, he uh, takes the title of Shogun, and he moves the capital to Edo, which is modern-day Tokyo. And this is how we get the capital moved uh, to Tokyo, uh, which today is, I believe, the largest city in the world. You know, we look at New York. I know, I know this is this is uh, off topic, but I just I remember reading about this a few years ago. We we're in America, and we think New York is so massive; it's got eight million people or something like that, or six million. And you know, look at look at Los Angeles, which is huge with millions of people. You know, how many people Tokyo has like twenty six million people. It is by far the largest city on the planet. It is it is hugely populated and. Um, it's just so many people in such a such a small area. It's uh, interesting. I'm gonna visit there one day. Uh, let's get back on topic. Okay. All right. The Tokugawa shogunate. It's known as a shogunate because it, the shogun it becomes the title of the leader, the the uh, the emperor, if you will, it takes his title of shogun. So it's called a shogunate. Um, he brings further peace. He influences increase in Japanese population. We see many laws, all kinds of restrictions kept in place, um, like taking up weapons, for instance. After he took over, he passed a law requiring all weapons to be confiscated from anyone who wasn't an official part of the government. There you go. The way you can keep the population from rising up against you and trying to overthrow you, take away all their weapons. Um, yeah, so he instituted laws like that. In, in his in his the way he would have been worded was that it was to keep the peace but the way we're going to keep the peace is we're going to be the only ones with the weapons and you guys aren't going to have any so nothing really do if we're running the show and we do whatever we want because uh, we're the only ones with the swords um yeah it's smart and if it works and you can get away with it it's smart because it's a way to really maintain power and maintain control if you're the only one that has the weapons um 
He restricted movement between social classes. You couldn't, um, you could not elevate yourself. You were basically controlled as far as what your status was, what you could do, where you could go, where you could move around. Uh, no such thing as civil rights under the Tokugawa shogun. And all kinds of restrictions on society. Where you could travel, where you could live. Uh, w there were rules about marriages, um, rules about weapons, uh, all kinds of interesting stuff. He even was known to keep hostages of prominent members of society, people who had some type of status or power. He would actually require them to keep family members in the palace. Uh, obviously meaning as a threat. It's a threat of coercion. Hey, if you don't do what I tell you to do, I'm going to kill your mom. Nice. Uh, yeah, stuff like that. Let's see. Um, that's how you keep the peace. Uh, yeah. Uh, keep the peace through violence, terrorism, uh, coercion. Yeah. All right. Uh, samurai were sort of, uh, they were noble. They were like the aristocratic leaders. Think like a lord or something. Uh, think like a, an English lord, only able to kill you with a sword. Um, samurai, there were lords, there were nobles, there were restrictions, there were all kinds of policies. Um, they were supposed to keep the peasants separate from the samurai because the idea is the peasants would potentially lead sort of like generals. Peasants might take over peasant armies. And so they tried to separate the different classes to ensure that the smaller class, which had the authority and power and money and maybe weapons, uh, who could actually lead peasant armies couldn't really be connected. So they couldn't necessarily um, sort of uh, lead or start or, or lead revolutions or revolts. Furthermore, um, the upper classes were only ones that uh, were allowed to be educated. Uh, samurais would have been included in that. So lower classes were not allowed any sort of education. And so the idea was if they're not educated, they don't have knowledge, they don't have the ability to understand there is something better, to rise up, to revolt, to question authority. Um, might have cut out there for a moment. It's all right, you didn't miss anything. Let's see what else we have going on here. Uh, most people kept most people from owning land, loan ownership restrictions, only the highest levels. Uh, even above the samurai was known as the daimyo. Uh, D-A-I-M-Y-O, the daimyo, they were like the highest level of lords. Um, so they, they were very restricted to only a very small group of people were allowed to have any type of authority or power. Um, it seems like it would be a society that wouldn't work, but the thing is it did because there was such a very strong feeling of honor and responsibility and respect for those upper class people. Um, that uh, plus there was the military very militaristic if you broke a rule you broke a law you could be immediately executed um, legally by like the daimyos and the samurais if you broke certain rules and laws they had the right to kill you on the spot legally so it helped keep a lot of the lower classes in check um, uh, it's interesting land ownership restrictions as i say there let's see what else uh, concerns about the loyalty of the Chinese Christians and others. We see ambitions of European powers. There was a significant um, uh, Christian population in Eastern Europe. Now, relatively speaking, Eastern Asia, sorry. Relatively speaking, in, in relation to the population in general, really small and almost insignificant. But even a million Chinese Christians is a huge number. But compared to 300 million population, that's a third of a percent. That's insignificant to the point where many people would live their entire lives in China and never even see or even heard of Christians, even though there might have been a couple million of them living in there. So there's a lot of concerns, lots of animosity between China and Japan in general. China and Japan had basically gone back and had war for centuries. There was always war, conflict, and issues. There was never, China and Japan would never have been what we would think of as really friendly uh, peoples. They had pretty much always been a conflict going back to ancient history. So we have lots of concern of, of Chinese Christians. We have lots of concern about other Europeans showing up because Europeans are sailing all over the place. European ships are all over. The, China, the Japanese people are very well aware of Europeans, Chinese Christians, of the Europeans, which are all pretty much Christian. Um, and there was a real fear of this 
Christianity somehow infecting or influencing the Japanese. Um, they're concerned about that. And so Japan was very isolationist. Japan wanted little or anything to do with um, uh, anyone. And they did persecute. There was, there was a couple little pockets of Japanese Christians that would occasionally pop up. And they would be immediately persecuted, expelled, exiled to a, a small island by themselves, or even executed. There was zero tolerance for any type of outside faith. And again, Japanese religion doesn't really fit any other type of mold in Western culture as we think of. They didn't have like an established world type religion. Um, it was more of a cultural religion as well. Uh, cultural, spiritual, religious belief that didn't really match up or align well with what we think of as Christianity or Islam. It was just different to us, and they weren't really accepting of it. But have no doubt, I'm sure the Christians uh, were not accepting of Chinese religious belief, spiritual belief, or Japanese either. So um, it went both ways. Neither religions have been historically in history not tolerant. Um, Honestly, looking back in this time his time period, going through all of these time period, the most tolerant world religion would be Islam, uh, more so than any other religious belief going through this, these middle era, 14 to 1800s. Uh, more tolerant than Chinese cultural, Japanese cultural, uh, Christianity, Hinduism. Um, I cannot speak to Judaism. I would be wrong to say. I, mean, I can't speak to the tolerance there of Judaism. But as far as the other larger religious beliefs, Islam would have probably been the most tolerant, truthfully. Um, uh, most other other religious spiritual beliefs, they simply believed theirs was superior and everyone else was inferior. And um, you don't worship ours. We really don't want anything to do with you, even to the point of even to the point of death, even. It's pretty, pretty typical uh, as far as that general idea of religious belief. Um, you can see on the map here, just gives you an idea of what we're talking about. Uh, samurai are more, very, more like, like local areas, almost like a, the role they, they, they fulfilled was almost like the local knight or like in feudal society or even like a local mayor. The samurai would be the local authority within his town. Um, daimyos would be more like a governor of like a region or uh, like a, a region. And then it was all the shogun was the ultimate lord, was the ultimate lord. Since probably the 1200s, North Japan and South Japan had been really separated uh, as two different societies. We see really under the Tokugawa shogunate the first time in centuries that we have a generally united Japan. Now, it doesn't mean every single island. Uh, there's lots of islands in Japan beyond the main one. Uh, but generally speaking, it, had, it was a united Japan. Um, and it was united under a military dictatorship, under a military um, totalitarian type government. It was, it was united under an iron fist of the shoguns. They were brutal. Uh, you followed the rules, that's fine, but anytime you broke the rules, as I said, most authorities, daimyo, samurai, shoguns, uh, they had the authority to execute you on the spot if you broke rules, even, even rules so much as dishonoring someone. Literally being a dishonorable person given certain circumstances, they could execute you on the spot. Legally. Right. Um, okay. Commercialization and growth of towns. We see in this period the creation of the Japanese capitalistic system. It is interesting how much what develops in Japan actually mirrors the United States. And there's some reasons for this. Um, uh, creation of this Japanese capitalistic system starts with guilds. Guilds, of course, is like something we see in Europe. This guild system, which I talk about in early world history. Uh, with European society. Merchants and artisans create very specific products, usually like oil, for instance, or metal, or sake. Uh, a very specific product produced by a specific group of, of people and businesses, and that's what they work on. That's what they produce. And the guild basically moderates. Moderates is the wrong word. That's not the right word I want to use. Um, 
Anyway, price regulation, the word may come to me in a minute. And the guild controls the prices, controls the product, controls the manufacturer, the sale of the product. Um, and these guilds answer to the government. So this is basically government-controlled, uh, state-controlled uh, production and manufacture. Uh, they want to make sure they produce, they, they respect that, not, that they control the production, the cost, com competition. They want to make sure all the tax revenue went properly to the proper authorities. Very controlled and structured society uh, at every level. Money lending was a very profitable business. There was a great deal of capital accrued. Uh, of course, large urban areas always have a lot of money. Uh, sometimes entire regions, almost all the revenue really comes out of like the local city. Lots of revenue, lots of money. We see rich families really sort of come to dominate uh, Japanese culture, rich banking houses, um, wealthy families, and the houses come to follow the names of the families. And sometimes entire regions become beholden to one single family running the most prosperous guild or guilds in that region. And they come to, at least economically, they may not technically be in charge militarily, but economically they come to dominate entire regions of Japan, uh, specific wealthy families. Um, they establish these wealthy, uh, the, these uh, loaning out money, controlling the guilds. We see these family-style business operations, uh, all aspects family-controlled. Almost think like the idea of the mob, uh, family-run business. The families control all aspects of it, from the sale, the production, the manufacture, the loans, the businesses, the, sh the ships, if there were ships involved, or trade. Um, they ran the accounts, and the rank in these societies was based upon the rank in the family was, was associated with your business. So whatever rank you were in the family would mirror whatever rank you were in the business. Um, by the way, this is still uh, a big part of the economic uh, culture in Japan today, to this very day. Even though Japan is a much more democratic society today, it's not like the Shogun. It's, it's a generally more modern democratic society, sort of. Um, it is still largely organized by family and industry, even though they probably don't use the term guild. I, I don't know, but I don't assume so. But it's still, they're organized by family, by different, mar different types of market and manufacturing goods. Uh, and it is incredibly rank driven. Businesses and family rank often, again, still coinciding today in modern Japanese culture. Uh, this is something which has, was, this became a, 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 um, a staple of Japan's economic culture that is still solidly there to this very day. It's interesting. Um, really interesting how it became, basically became part, just part, become, become part of Japanese culture. The life and people in the Edo period. This period when uh, Tokyo or Edo at the time became the central to their society. The samurai and daimyo um, had limited power. Um, much of the power was given just to the shogun. Uh, they became, previously, they were the knights. They were the warriors. That's how they got their status. Now status in the Edo period, by close to the 1800s, status becomes really more about economic status uh, and family status. It isn't a, it, Every daimyo and samurai can't pull out a sword and defeat you in one-on-one -on -one combat anymore. By the 1800s, a lot of them may not even know how to fight like that. Uh, they may not even know how to do that. They might have trained or practiced as a, as a child. But uh, actually seeing direct combat, which in most Japanese culture for most of its history would have been standard, would have been standard uh, to have status in Japan. You had to have actually seen and fought in combat, and you had to be a successful combatant, whether it was on the battlefield or strategically. Um, not anymore. Uh, by the 1800s, being a successful samurai daimyo is more about economics. Uh, and family name and lineage 
Uh, I'm sure there's still a few out there that are excellent swordsmen, but it's not what it's about anymore. Many of them don't even wear the swords, or if they do wear the swords, it's ceremonial. Uh, they wouldn't really know how to fight with them well. A lot of them, it's simply about status now. Um, which, you know, part of that is it has to do with what the shoguns wanted. Uh, under the shogunate, initially, they took away a lot of their weapons. They wanted them. They wanted to be a more successful uh, economically. They wanted Japan to be... And actually, the shogunate did that. The Tokugawa shogunate made Japan into an economic power in Asia. It did. Uh, eventually, eventually, Japan becomes the very first industrialized nation in all of Asia. Uh, so, it's successful. In the long run, it's very successful for Japan. It just changes what it means to be uh, a lord. Uh, it's not about swords anymore. It's about coins. It's interesting. Um, we see lots of culture change. We see it, it, instead of practicing on the battlefield, they go to restaurants, theater, prostitution becomes standard. Um, uh, it simply becomes part of the life. Uh, men are expected to go out and sleep with other women. It's simply cultural. Uh, married men sleep with other women. Uh, prostitute, it becomes a, there's a whole industry, uh, a, a part of the culture that's a large industry in prostitution. Um, restaurants, theater, lots of services, becomes a service industry. Uh, all the major cities really become more about culture and entertainment, things like that. Kabuki theater uh, was an art form uh, featuring elaborate costumes, song, dance, poetry, I think theater, sort of musical theater a lot, very intricate, detailed. Um, lots of appearance of women, but kabuki theater, the women were almost exclusively men uh, in this time period. They, that, that changes a little bit later. It does change sort of, but most of the women's roles were men um, because it was not thought a proper place for women. Here's the irony. Um, while on stage, men will be performing dressed as women because it was not thought appropriate for women. It's nothing really, nothing sexual. It's just they didn't think it was appropriate for women to be there. So if it was a theater production that had women, the guys would wear their women's clothes. And yet in the crowd would be prostitutes uh, because those are not the same status. Prostitutes were almost an other status-wise. They didn't necessarily have an official status. So they almost didn't exist. Now, don't be confused. There were um, women who worked in Kabuki theater who were entertainers. There were a few. And they were social people who, who would talk with these geishas. They weren't necessarily prostitutes. They, weren't, they were treated like property, and they often could be treated poorly. But they weren't necessarily prostitutes. They were more consorts or companions. Uh, the geisha, which often were associated with the kabuki theater. They were also sort of a separate class. Um, but a proper woman, an educated woman, would never be in a kabuki theater. Uh, it was only for the men. The, most of these pleasures and entertainments and all of the culture that you would see in the cities of Japan was almost all exclusively for men. Uh, poetry, song, dance, entertainment all through the 1700s, 1800s, was almost exclusively, uh, even maybe this back to the 1600s, was really almost exclusively for the, for the men. Uh, very, very, very sexist society. And you could say that about Japan even still today, um, even though uh, it's much changed. There's still, there's been a lot of criticism and critique of Japan in recent years uh, about, there's uh, still a lot of sexist ideas patriarchal ideas. Uh, Japan is still probably one of the most patriarchal societies in the world, even though it is still a modern society. It's a great ally of the United States. They're one of our best friends. They, this this patri patriarchy, this idea of male dominance, has, was so ingrained into their culture, it still is very dominant in Japanese society to this day. Um, it's interesting. Class-based society like in Europe, mostly balanced, uh, of course, large peasant society, very large peasant society, heavily taxed. Uh, legally, economically, uh, educationally, peasants were treated as children. That's That was their status. The status of a typical peasant would have been a child. Almost no legal status, little or no education, 
uh, poor, um, very few rights of anything of any sort. Um, yeah, uh, considered barely competent. They were really, really one uh, an oppressed society, Japanese peasant society. Merchants were above that. Merchants were more comfortable, um, even if they weren't necessarily wealthy because they weren't allowed to be. The guild system really controlled wealth, and wealth flowed right to the top. So the peasants, of course, had nothing. Merchants in the middle led a very maybe sort of low middle class lifestyle. They were quasi comfortable, not wealthy, not at all. Like in American society, merchants became like kings. Merchants became some of the most wealthy people in American society. But in Japanese society, they controlled how much wealth you could have other than the very highest rank where almost all the wealth flowed up to the top. Um, uh, even more so than in Western culture. Uh, which is interesting. So it was practically serfdom. It was not technically slavery. It wasn't. But it was such a poor life and you had so few opportunities or options in your life. Uh, it was like Eastern European serfdom that was... You were tied to the land, you had no rights, you were barely treated as a class above animals. It was pretty bad. Um, your, your job was to produce whatever you were supposed to produce. Whatever the product you produced, whatever natural resource, agricultural, mineral, whatever it was, fish, that was your job. And that's really any sort of joint you got of life, you had to make yourself with your own family, and it was treated pretty badly. Um, natural disasters were so common. This was one of the most bombarded regions with natural disasters. From volcanoes to tsunamis to earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, ocean storms, famines, droughts. Yes, you'd think droughts, right? Absolutely. you got to consider almost all that water around Japan is undrinkable, unusable. You can't water crops with it. You can't drink it. It's ocean water. It's practically useless other than the fish you get out of it. Um, so droughts were still common, uh, all that kind of stuff. Be like being, being on an island out in the middle of the ocean, surrounded by water and you drown or drown. Sorry. You, um, you, uh, you, you dehydrate, you, uh, die of dehydration, you know, fresh water, uh, ocean water, seawater is useless. Very patriarchal. As I said, strong male patriotic society, women were subservient. Uh, men had all authority in both business, society, at the home. Um, rarely, um, and we talk about this in European society, you know, because I mostly teach like Western history of, of Europe and America. Uh, America and Europe was very patriarchal, absolutely. This was a whole other class. This was a whole other thing, um, a whole other level of patriarchy and female oppression far surpassing what we saw in Europe or America. It's just, it's not even really comparable. Uh, women were treated as, well, wives and daughters were practically treated as slaves. It's pretty extreme, actually. If you really study and look at this, the life of a woman in Japanese society in this sort of this medieval period, um, rough, really rough. This is an image of a kabuki theater. Inside of the theater, you have, uh, it sort of looks like some men up there on stage, maybe sumo wrestlers. You have all the men uh, watching, and there's a few women, but these women you see that are walking around, they're, they're probably prostitutes, probably. Um, we see better off customers. Where do you think the better off customers are sitting? Where do you think the richer customers are sitting? Up at the top, right? Uh, that's the way it is. That's the way it is. The richer people get the higher status. They get the boost up at the top, the more private, the uh, more common individuals out here in the middle. Uh, you still see samurai. There's a samurai carrying a sword. So you still see that even. Um, this is the more regular folks. But even a samurai is more of a common compared to like the daimyos and the lords up here at the top or the family guild leaders. Family guild leaders you'd see up here at the top. Those are the richest people in society, the ones that run the guilds, the, run, the heads of the families. Um, so less money, more expensive at the top. Uh, let's see. We do see most people 
Actually, no, not really. If you look at it, how many are looking at stage? Only maybe half are actually looking at the stage. Most are actually focused on other things because the Kabuki Theater was interesting. It was an all-around entertainment. You had Pleasures of the Flesh. You had Pleasures of the Theater, Pleasures of the Mind. You had drinks. You had food. You had smoking. You had everything. It was it was meant it was it was a men's club with every type of entertainment uh, from pleasures of the flesh to intellectual to cultural alcoholic everything it was all included it was a one stop shop for everything to entertain and please and divert your mind away from working in your business or working in the guild all day long working in the business and the shops running the government. That's where you would come, and you could go in there and do anything. Um, and it was not supposed to be talked about either. Um, it was supposed to be entire, entirely, it wasn't supposed to be business either. Uh, there was rules against, they weren't supposed to be conducting business. It was supposed to be purely about, when you went in, you were, you were supposed to be able to go in and leave sort of anonymously. It wasn't technically anonymous, but the idea was... Um, You've heard that thing about Vegas, right? What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. It was that. What happens in the Kabuki Theater stays in the Kabuki Theater. You might see someone there who might be a competitor of yours in business. Someone who out on the street or in the corporate office you would hate. Or be a vile competitor or you lost money to. Or might even be a political enemy or something. But in there, you weren't supposed to bring that in. It was supposed to be sort of a place outside. And, of course, you know, that's idealized. Nothing's perfect. I'm sure shit happened. But it's supposed to be like that. That was the idea behind it. It's quite interesting. Um, there's been a lot of studies done on the Kabuki Theater and its significance. And it has been attributed to being a significant core part of Japanese culture in the last few centuries. Uh, sort of touching on almost all aspects of Japanese culture. Quite interesting stuff. Imagine somewhere, someplace, there's probably entire classes where you could take a university class that probably spends a whole class just studying uh, things like that. Maritime trade, which means ocean, ocean trade, uh, piracy, the entry of Europe into the Asian maritime sphere. This is where some of the things get interesting. Um, Europeans show up and they screw shit up. They do. Um, the Japanese were right on that aspect, at least. Let's keep the Europeans out. It wasn't anything to do with religion, although that was part of their issue was religion. They were really, really, really scared of Christianity for some reason, which I'm still not exactly sure why they were so scared of it. But they I, maybe just because Christianity represented Europe, because every European that showed up was a Christian, so uh, they were sort of considered synonymous, maybe. And so... They were just really, really scared of anything Christian. Again, even killing Christians, even killing uh, people who were Christians and missionaries and Japanese Christians were executed at times. Um, and maybe they simply considered it synonymous with Europe. Christian, Europe, Europe, Christian. We hate the Europeans. We hate the Christians, etc. Um, but the Europeans show up and it does cause a lot of problems. And... So, Europeans come along. Of course, what did European want? Europe's wanted, they wanted access to Asian, they wanted access to the Asian action. They wanted access to food, the supplies, the treasures of the Orient is a term they might have used back then. Uh, the wealth, the gems, the spice trade. We haven't really talked about the spice trade, but spices, different types of spices and food seasonings. Oh my gosh. Again, another thing I, I've said multiple times, and I'm, it's not hyperbole when I say this. Some of this stuff was worth its weight in gold. It really was. These spices and stuff. They were so valuable. Um, uh, and so they wanted that. They wanted access to those goods because they were so valuable. I mean, there are stories of people going to the Orient, which is a term we don't really use today, but it is a term appropriate for this time period, Asia, India, Southeast Asia, and coming back with a boat, one single boat full of goods, and that's it, they were done. Their entire life was set. They made so much money off of one single shipload of goods, they were going to be a comfortable person financially for the rest of their lives. Just one successful trip. Um, you might think, oh, it's just one trip, not a big deal. It actually was. 
About half of all ships that sail from Europe to the Orient, to Asia, never return. So from the moment you took off on your ship leaving Europe, it was a 50-50 chance that you were going to ever come back. So right off from the bat right there, so many things, so many things that could cause problems. You could run out of food, supplies, weather, pirates. I mean, you just name it. There's a whole list of stuff. Um, so it was incredibly risky. But the rewards, if you were able to be back and make it back successfully, you could be rich. Um, so the Europe's wanted, the Europeans wanted, they didn't care how to do it, whether they could do it through legitimate trade, piracy, smuggling, legal, illegal, and of course, what is legal, illegal in this time period, laws are incredibly, um, fluid, I suppose is a good word to put it, uh, in this time period, who really knows, um, as long as it's about profits, as long as it's about making money, um, that was what was most important. All right, they targeted all these different regions, all these places where there was resources available, things that were different. That was another big thing. One of the, the best selling things in Europe was simply the different, whatever it was, the exotic. Uh, whether it was a good, a product, clothing, an animal, a slave, whatever was exotic, what was different, whatever was unique was often some of the best selling goods. It would simply fetch a high price because it was different. Uh, and of course, most of the things being bought from Asia were different of almost every category. Everything was different. So China, Japan, Korea, Southeast Asia, um, wherever they, wherever went, we see the Dutch, the Portuguese, the British, the French, um, the Spanish, uh, all these countries had been hitting Southeast Asia and having ships travel to Southeast Asia since the 1600s. So uh, now by the 1700s, trade gets intense because the trade routes are well established. Um, the trade ports along the way where you can stop and refuel and get water, et cetera, are well established. Uh, so it gets much more successful and much more regular and many, many more ships by the 1800s. But uh, these places they had heard about in East Asia had been on Europeans' minds for centuries by this time period. Um, so yeah, the Dutch, Portuguese, uh, they often use force. Uh, remember they show up with cannons, they show up with guns, they show up ships with armed with cannons. They would even fire on Japanese, Chinese ships. They would pull up along, uh, towns or communities that they could, that were close to the water. They would actually sail their ships up close and fire on the towns and villages, uh, stuff like that. Um. We see a very prosperous port established by the Dutch, Macau. Uh, this becomes a major trading port, and it remains under Portuguese control until 1999, uh, where it was released. Um, it's a very, very prosperous trade area. I do. I, I, I stopped there for a moment to look at it. I did make a little mistake there. Uh, I said it, but I. Macau was established by the Portuguese. I think I said Dutch at one point. But anyway, Macau was established by the Portuguese. Uh, the Portuguese uh, controlled it until 1999. And I believe, I don't have it in my notes, but I believe Macau is now, is actually part of China. I believe it's part of China today. Um, uh, so, as the Japanese and Chinese markets were forced to open, uh, often, often at gunpoint, there's even, we even get a term to this. There's a, there's a political term referred to as gunboat diplomacy. Uh, forcing them to have diplomatic relations, which is really about trade, but ha forcing them to have relations with Western powers, the Europe and the United States, we get in on this, uh, at, at, at uh, the end of a barrel, a uh, gun or a cannon, forcing them to negotiate and work with us um, under the threat of uh, violence uh, or actual violence. Yeah, this gunboat diplomacy. Um, this new world exchange of goods, food, crop, agriculture, uh, silver becomes the uh, hard currency used mostly. Silver becomes the biggest currency that is traded. And that's as a result of Spain. For centuries, Spain had been the global standard for trade. They sort of set the global standard for trade and exchange, and it was a silver standard. Because uh, by the 1700s, half of the entire world's silver supply was supplied by Spain. 
just that one country. Most of those mines were in the Americas. Uh, we've talked about that before. And so much of the goods that were traded across the world were often traded. Uh, often one of the exchange products was uh, silver. Um, and the, ja the Chinese really wanted the silver. The Chinese really wanted it. They coveted the silver, probably because they turned around and used it in, in art and culture and made items out of it, made uh, dishes and plates and art and silverware, things like that, you know, back when silverware was really made out of silver. Um, yeah, so this huge, huge demand for silver in Asia, especially China, uh, they traded everything, potatoes, corn, tobacco, opium, silk, silver, that's opium plant right there in the bottom, and we have silver there. Uh, incredible amount of trade routes. This increased population, increased nutrition, increased wealth uh, for both Europeans and Chinese and Japanese. And yeah, in the 1800s, which we're not to that yet, this chapter ends around 1800. We, you're, uh, we, the United States, do the same exact thing. We force Japan to actually trade with us at the end of a cannon barrel. We do the same thing. Once we become an, uh, an international power and have our ships, the United States gets in on all this and does many of the same similar things. Um, let's see what else we want to say. We can see the map here. Give you an idea of some of these trade routes uh, going across. This was crazy, the risk you took, because you had to sail from Europe all the way around Africa, all the way through the Indian Ocean, all the way around India, all the way through Southeast Asia. Massive, sometimes these journeys, um, and it wasn't like they went straight. They often would stop. They might stop and pick up and trade supplies in Africa, and then pick up and trade supplies in East Africa, and then pick up and trade supplies in India. So they might stop and trade supplies a dozen times before they would go from Europe and go to East Asia and get back to Europe. They might be gone years, sometimes be gone years. Um, and a lot of folks never returned. I mean, certainly there's a few that probably stopped along the way and established homes and just chose to live in different places. They probably happened, uh, certainly some uh, did choose to do that. Uh, but it was a really dangerous life, very adventurous. But whether you were a legitimate uh, business person or you were a, uh, a pirate or a smuggler, yeah. Let's see if I have this other image on here. Oh, I do. This is interesting. Dutch on the left, Japanese on the right. Really interesting. So we have this Dutch, um, probably a sailor or merchant, merchant probably. And this is a very interesting image. Because we have the Dutch on the left, white, very white, trading with the Japanese lord on the right, probably samurai, maybe daimyo uh, on the right, um, probably someone who's the head of a guild of some sort, the head of a family. Um, now, there's the rest of the image. There's things in this image that are neither Japanese nor Dutch. We can see his culture. We can see the culture and the clothing of, of the Dutch person here. Dutch, right? I know I said Dutch. Make sure it's Dutch. Is that right? Yeah, Dutch. Um, the long hair, the style. I mean, they're obviously incredibly different. The leggings, very, very different. What about the dark servants? What about the dark-skinned, dark-haired servants? Those are obviously not Dutch, and they're obviously not Japanese. Who could they be? Probably, we don't know for sure. Um, I've looked at I've looked at this image and read a little bit about it. It's not one hundred percent sure, but probably Southeast Asian, probably Indonesian, probably um, servants. Now, whose are they? Whose are who are are they Japanese servants or are they the Dutch servants? That is also unclear. Probably servants brought by the Dutch with him as a way of sort of showing his status and power that he has servants that he carries with him. Are they slaves? Technically, no. Probably not, but practically. Uh, they're servants that are treated very poorly, probably very treated very badly. But it's very interesting how these servants are brought with 
um, the Dutch. He's brought into this home, this Japanese home, and he brings his own entertainment, brings his own food, brings his own servants. It's quite interesting. What does it really show? It shows the cross-cultural interactions. It shows the interactions of multiple regions. And it shows what they valued in the time period. Uh, what does a Japanese value? They've got the teacups, most likely. Most likely those are teacups. On the left, you've got rice. So you've got rice, you've got teacups, you've got music. Um, you've got music there on the right playing a... Ooh, what is that? I don't know what that is. I don't have my notes. Uh, some of you probably know exactly what that is. Um, it's just interesting. Um, then culturally in the back, you can see all the Japanese elements. Of course, the entire architecture, the swords on the wall, the artwork of Japan was very, 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 very uh, natural artwork. We see so much of their artwork that involves nature, flowers, plants. It's kind of a weird irony, considering how martial their civilization was for most of its history, how physical and combat it was really geared, and yet a lot of their art and architecture ref reflects peace and tranquility and nature. It's really interesting juxtaposition of the two things which seem very opposite. Um, just shows the real, true complexity of Japanese culture and Japanese uh, society. Uh, it's quite interesting stuff. I think that ends it. Yep, that ends it. Appreciate you going through it with me, and we'll see you in class. Bye.